Greetings and welcome to the February Women's Health Awareness Real Talk webinar. Women's Health Awareness is excited to celebrate its eighth year of working collaboratively with our communities to decrease environmental health disparities and to promote healthier lives for women. I'm Joan Packenham, Chair of the Women's Health Awareness Steering Committee and Director for this NIEHS Women's Environmental Health Initiative. On behalf of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the Women's Health Awareness Steering Committee, and our co-sponsors, the Durham Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and North Carolina Central University, thank you for joining this webinar. We are extremely honored to have each of you with us this evening. This evening, we are celebrating Heart Health Month and bringing awareness and education on how to have a healthy heart. This is an important informative infographic from the National Institutes of Health, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. 28 days toward a healthy heart. This calendar has helpful tips to help you implement a regular routine to keep your heart healthy. Please take a look at this important resource on the Women's Health Awareness website. Tonight's webinar is What's Hot in Women's Heart Health? Keeping you informed. Our chair for tonight's session is Dr. Angelo Moore from Duke Cancer Institute. And our two speakers for this evening are Mrs. Rosa, co-founder of Rosa Foundation, and Dr. Brandy Patterson, cardiologist for Duke Health. Before we move forward to our presentations, please let me provide you with a few reminders. This session will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. American Sign Language and closed captioning services are available throughout this webinar. Evaluations will be sent immediately after webinar through email. Please note, for completing the webinar and evaluation, you will receive educational contact credit hours for your participation. A few webinar housekeeping details. The Zoom question and answer or Q&A is located at the bottom of your Zoom window when it is full size. This is important that your window has to be full size to access the Q&A function. Use the Q&A function during the question and answer session or if you have a question for staff. During the question and answer session, use the Q&A icon to click open the question box, type your question in the box, and hit enter. Use the thumbs up icon to like a question, as this gives the question priority ranking during the question and answer session. If you would like to send your question anonymously, be sure to check the, the send anonymously box to conceal your name. For the sake of time tonight, I would like to quickly introduce Dr. Angela Moore. Dr. Moore is the Assistant Director of Community Outreach, Engagement, and Equity for the Duke Center Cancer Center or Cancer Institute, Duke University. Dr. Moore has served on the HWA Steering Committee since June of 2019. At this time, I turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Moore. Dr. Moore. Thank you, Dr. Peckham, for that introduction. Good evening. Our first speaker is Ms. Tebony Rosa. She received her international business degree from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and her law degree from Toro College. She is the Deputy City Clerk of Greensboro and received the Outstanding Service and Employee of the Year Awards from the City of Greensboro. She also received the Employee of the Year Award from the Greensboro Police Department. She is a member of the North Carolina Association of Municipal Clerks, International Institute of Municipal Clerks, 
and the North Carolina Bar Association. So you definitely want to stay on her good side. She is also a member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Ms. Rosa, along with her husband, James, co-founded the Rosa Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization established in 2018 to serve and give back to the community. The Rosa Foundation participates in community outreach activities, such as providing food, clothing, training, education, mentorship, scholarships, as well as recognizing and honoring positive male role models. They serve communities in multiple counties throughout the state of North Carolina. In 2018, she was awarded the Go Red Woman Ambassador Award from the American Heart Association. And she is here this evening to tell us about her journey as a heart disease survivor. I present to you, Ms. Tebony Rosa. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for that introduction. It is certainly good to share with you tonight my survivor story. My journey began in a pre-COVID world in 2015 when I joined a running group. It was an all women's couch to 5K program, which afforded me a chance to do something different, meet new people and ramp up my exercise routine. I really enjoyed being part of the running community and even traveled to compete in a few races. On average, I was running about 10 miles a week and competing in two 5Ks a month. And mind you, I was also walking one to two miles during my lunch break about three times a week. So one would say I was exercising on a regular basis. Eventually, shin splints and other aches and pains a couple of years later were a signal for me to stick to walking. After losing 70 pounds, having a fabulous 40 birthday bash, and three months after getting married that following year, 2017 proved to be the challenge of a lifetime. At the end of September, I started noticing that I was winded after my lunchtime walks. It got to a point where I could not walk a block without having to stop and catch my breath. And this is when a friend would step in and say, well, you know, you're over 40 now, things are different. And one night I was awakened to this terrible chest pressure, something equivalent to an elephant pressing down on my chest. And this is when that little voice says, oh, do you think you have gas? Then there was the episode of dizziness. And when I told a friend of mine, she said, girl, you might be pregnant. Well, in October, everything happened at one time. After getting back from lunch, I had the chest pressure, a tingling sensation in my face and hands, and numbness down my left arm. I was having all of the signs of a heart attack at my desk, no less. My trip to the ER proved to be an anomaly of sorts. After 10 hours of being poked and prodded and scanned, my lab tests, normal. EKG, normal. X-rays, normal. I was diagnosed with acid reflux and given a prescription for the quote, purple pill, with advice to check and see if I was experiencing side effects from any current medication. The following week of doctor visits debunked the side effects myth. All of my labs were deemed perfect and I was in top physical condition, but I was still winded. So my primary care referred me to a cardiologist. I can say the cardiologist 
was very candid. He was baffled at why I was in his office. Here I was, an avid runner, 41 years old, great lab results, no cholesterol spikes, no outrageous blood pressure readings, no family history, and the algorithm indicated that I had only a 1% chance of ever having heart disease. Thank goodness he believed there was an issue and scheduled a stress test the following week. Now keep in mind that my symptoms started in September. It is now nearing the end of October. After a weekend beach trip, my husband and I spent most of our Wednesday morning at the clinic for the stress test. The nursing staff was great and I tried to stay optimistic. But after conquering that incline on the treadmill, I can just say, whoa, I really needed help getting off of the treadmill, stepping down and getting to a chair. I received many confused looks as the doctors rushed out with the test results. My husband and I went home so I could get some rest. That afternoon, I received a life-changing phone call. As tactful as he could, the cardiologist began rattling off statistics of me suffering a stroke or heart attack. And in my stupor, I asked, how common is this? Only to receive a reply of this is very rare. And if you don't get to the hospital within 48 hours, you will die. I had very little time to tell my family and there were looks of disbelief. As in the movies, my life did flash before my eyes. I was mostly in shock that I was on a path towards wellness only to receive a fatal diagnosis. Since my bags were still packed, I was now headed to the hospital on Friday. Following an angioplasty and stent procedure, I was still in a fentanyl induced haze as the surgeon provided an overview of how I had a 99% blockage in the LAD artery or the left anterior descending artery, better known as the Widowmaker. The surgeon was unsure how any blood was circulating in my body. It was at this moment I knew it was the higher power in control. It turned out that I was the youngest person in the cardiac wing of the hospital during my stay. Each nurse would come in and check the computer and do this slow turn to look at me and say, you're so young, what are you doing in here? And after about the fifth occurrence of this reaction, I would just comment and laugh. I needed to get away for a few days. But honestly, I was glad that my rehab contained discussions surrounding mental health. I was going through a roller coaster of emotions, happy to be alive, coupled with survivor's guilt, with a dose of why me. The word anomaly also kept dancing in my thoughts because at the time I thought that my journey was abnormal or peculiar. I later learned through other survivors that I was not alone in my journey. There were so many women who were dismissed and later passed away without having proper treatment. So many women who had a voice, now ultimately silenced. In the midst of my health scare, my husband and I spoke about what sort of legacy we would leave not only to our family, but to society. We were already doing community research, but cemented our mantra of giving back by paying it forward by creating a 501c3 nonprofit. Rosa Foundation seeks to fill gaps in humanitarian aid that comes in the form of food insecurity, support of Title I schools, youth programming, recognizing positive male role models, and providing scholarships for the performing arts. The scholarship application is currently on our website, which was created in memory of my mother who was a trailblazer in the field of ballet 
in the 60s and 70s who lost her battle with breast cancer. One of our upcoming health initiatives in November is to provide necessary screenings in communities of interest. The event will also serve as a fundraiser to support families with children born with heart defects. The goal is to honor the memory of my husband's son who passed away from heart disease at one and a half years old. I knew my body well enough to know when something did not feel right. Even though I was faced with resistance and a medical history that did not support my ultimate diagnosis of coronary artery disease, I did not hesitate to speak up. In conclusion, the key takeaway is to not second guess how you feel or dismiss a symptom as irrelevant. It could be a matter of life or death. I am truly grateful to share my story tonight to emphasize the importance of being an advocate for your health. Thank you. What an amazing story and thank you for sharing your personal journey with heart disease. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Our next speaker is Dr. Brandy Patterson. She completed medical school at the University of Miami, Leonard M. Miller School of Medicine. She then completed her residency in internal medicine at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh and a fellowship in cardiovascular disease at the University of Florida. She is a member of the American Board of Internal Medicine and an assistant professor of medicine at Duke University School of Medicine. Her clinical and research focuses are general cardiology, women's heart health, and cardiac care of cancer patients. She sees patients at Duke Cancer Center, Duke Medical Center Cardiac Clinic on the main campus of Duke University Hospital, and Duke Cardiology South Durham on Crooked Creek Parkway. I hope that you have some paper and uh, something to write with because she's gonna share her enormous amount of knowledge when it comes to heart disease, especially as it pertains to women. So I present to you, Dr. Brandy Patterson. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction. And it is quite an honor to be here and quite an honor to follow that story, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and I would also echo the same sentiment to not dismiss your symptoms. And if the physician or nurse practitioner or physician's assistant that you are seeing um, is not attending to your symptoms and your concerns accordingly, uh, then you should, should seek uh, alternate uh, medical care. Um, because if you're not being heard and you feel like you're not being heard, um, please advocate for yourself by seeking uh, alternate care. So today what I'm going to talk about is what is hot in women's heart health, keeping you informed. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So heart disease is the number one killer of women. One in three women die from heart disease, compared to one in 39 who die from breast cancer. But any way you look at it, it's just too many women are dying from heart disease. However, we can prevent it. When you look at this slide, I hope you can appreciate that there are more modifiable risk factors, which are highlighted in green, than non-modifiable risk factors. Looking at some of the modifiable risk factors, such as high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, physical inactivity, obesity, and high blood cholesterol, we can all do our part to manage that. Some of the non-modifiable risk factors such as age. Age is actually the number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease and coronary disease in particular. Gender as a risk factor. Men are more likely to have coronary artery disease. When, many, when women are premenopausal and they are still menstruating, we have estrogen and progesterone to protect our arteries and make them more pliable and elastic. 
This actually helps to reduce the rate at which plaque progresses inside of our coronary arteries until we become postmenopausal. Our risk for coronary, coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease increases to that of which men. Genetic factors, such as premature family history of coronary artery disease, that would be a primary relative if a man aged 55 years of age or younger. For a woman, premature coronary artery disease is defined as 65 years of age or younger. Race and ethnicity impact as well. Next slide, please. We talk about blood pressure as the force of blood against the arterial wall. If the blood pressure is too high, it can actually dilate or enlarge, enlarge the arteries, creating an aneurysm. The other thing that blood pressure can do is damage the inside of the artery walls, creating plaque and stenosis so that the artery is narrowed. On the right upper hand side, you can see what a normal coronary artery looks like. With prehypertension, it narrows, and with hypertension, it narrows even further. Next slide, please. The United States National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, has provided epidemiologic information on the prevalence and control of hypertension in the United States. Prior to the redefinition of hypertension by the 2017 ACC AHA guidelines, the prevalence of hypertension in the United States defined as taking an antihypertensive medication or having a systolic blood pressure of greater than 140 to 90 was approximately 30%. However, with the ACC AHA guidelines now stating hypertension as greater than or equal to 120 over 80, many more Americans, up to 50%, are now defined as being hypertensive. As everyone gets older, arterials will stiffen, so blood pressure does increase with age. And with race as well, African Americans have a higher prevalence of hypertension. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So high blood pressure not only affects the heart, it also affects the kidneys and the brain. Most people, when they think about high blood pressure, it causes coronary artery disease, but it can also cause heart failure and atrial fibrillation. In fact, the heart actually dilates and can thicken from high blood pressure, which ultimately weakens the heart muscle and leads to heart failure. In the picture on the right-hand side, you'll see that the electrical activity of the heart is disorderly when high blood pressure stretches out the atrium, which is the top chamber of the heart on the left-hand side, creating atrial fibrillation. So hypertension is the number one risk factor for atrial fibrillation, which can ultimately cause a stroke. Next slide, please. Diabetes is a big problem as well. In 2006, African-Americans with diabetes were one and a half times more likely to be hospitalized and two times more likely to die from diabetes than non-Hispanic whites. Close to 20% of all African-Americans aged 20 years of age or older have diagnosed or undiagnosed diabetes compared with about 7% of non-Hispanic white Americans. The risk of diabetes is 77% higher among African-Americans than among non-Hispanic white Americans. And this is really important because diabetes is associated with an approximately two-fold increased risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, and cardiovascular disease mortality. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we manage these modifiable risk factors such as diabetes and high blood pressure, cholesterol? The American Heart Association still recommends eating a Mediterranean diet for heart health. They also recommend two days of strength, train of strength training with weights and either 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week or 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. Jogging, swimming, laps, and singles tennis are examples of high intensity or vigorous exercise. And you can gauge your breath. Um, that will help you gauge the intensity of your exercise. You won't be able to speak more than a few words if you're doing vigorous exercise. The other way to gauge if you're doing high intensity exercise is by your heart rate. 220 minus your age is the maximum heart rate for your age. 
75 to 90 percent of that would be consistent with vigorous exercise. If you're going to do moderate intensity exercise, that would be similar to devil's tennis, a brisk walk at four miles per hour, and as well as water aerobics. Um, you can breathe uh, and you're sweating, you're able to talk, but you're not able to sing your favorite song. That's a good way to gauge it. If you're going to measure it by heart rate, it would be 65 to 75% of your maximum heart rate for your age. Now you've gone on and, and went ahead and started exercising, but now you start having chest pain. As we know, cardiac disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, yet only two to 4% of patients presenting to the primary care office with chest pain have unstable angina or evidence of a heart attack. The most common causes of chest pain in the primary care setting are chest wall pain up to 50%, reflux esophagitis up to 20%, and costochondritis, which is inflammation of the ribs, up to 13%. Chest pain accounts for almost 8 million annual visits to the emergency department in the United States, making it the second most common complaint. Yet less than 15 to 30% of patients who present to the emergency department with non-traumatic chest pain have acute coronary syndrome, such as myocardial infarction or unstable angina. Looking at the top, you can see different causes of chest pain. And of course, number one would be the heart. Um, myocardial infarction, a heart attack, pericarditis and myocarditis, which we'll review on the next slide. Endocarditis is an infection of the heart valve and aortic dissection, as well as mitral valve prolapse are all causes of chest pain. But if you look below, you'll see a picture of the lungs. The lungs can actually cause chest pain as well from a pneumonia, pleurisy, pulmonary embolism, or tension pneumothorax. The rib cage can cause chest pain from trauma, rib fracture, and metastasis. GI etiologies are pretty common as well to cause chest pain, such as gastritis, esophagitis, peptic ulcer disease, esophageal spasm, cholecystitis, which is a problem with the gallbladder, as well as pancreatitis. And of course, there's also muscular, musculoskeletal pain and arthritis, Next slide, please. So on this slide, I've illustrated some non-ischemic cardiac causes of chest pain, meaning that they're not coming from the coronary arteries. On the top left-hand side, you'll see a picture of the heart where you see the left ventricle. That's the main pumping chamber of the heart. Again, with high blood pressure and other reasons as well, sometimes the heart can weaken. So patients with heart failure may also present with, with chest discomfort, usually along though with progressive dyspnea, shortness of breath, cough, fatigue, and swelling in the legs. The picture in the middle is an illustration of the different linings of the heart. The endocardium is the inner lining, the myocardium is in the middle, and then the epicardium is on the outside. Just outside of that is the pericardium. That pericardium, the very outside lining, can become inflamed from infection, medications, autoimmune disorders, malignancy, and patients that have inflammation of the pericardium have sharp chest pain, and it is increased with inspiration and decreased by leaning forward in a seated position. It's also often associated with fever as well. Myocarditis refers to inflammation of the cardiac muscle, um, and it's also due to infections and non-infective causes, and the symptoms are similar to pericarditis. One can also have aortic valve disease. Looking up at the left-hand picture, the aortic valve you can see on the top right, it is the valve that is in between the left ventricle and the aorta, and it can become stenosed or closed off. When this happens, patients usually present with exertional chest pain and shortness of breath and have a decrease in their exercise tolerance as well. Patients with aortic dissection on the right-hand side have a medical emergency typically and present with acute and severe chest pain. Next slide, please. I'm gonna just mention a few uh, causes of chest pain that are more commonly seen in women. And the first one is called SCAD. It's spontaneous coronary artery dissection. It is an infrequent cause of acute heart attack, but it is more common in women and in younger patients. Potential predisposing risk factors include fibromuscular dysplasia, 
postpartum status, having more than four kids, connective tissue disorders, systemic inflammatory conditions, and hormonal therapy. The underlying mechanism isn't fully understood, but we believe that there's a tear in the inner lining of the coronary artery and then a blood clot basically forms. And that obviously can cut off blood supply and lead to myocardial ischemia or infarction. Next slide, please. Um, you all may have heard about Takasubo, especially during the pandemic. Uh, Takasubo is also more commonly seen in women. It's also called stress cardiomyopathy. And it's a syndrome that's characterized by heart dysfunction that often occurs in the setting of physical or emotional stress or critical illness. The term takasubo is taken from the Japanese name for an octopus trap, which has a shape that's similar to the ballooning appearance of the left ventricle in the most common and typical forms of this disorder. On the right-hand side, you'll see a picture of neurons that go from the brain and from the spinal cord. And this is because the postulated mechanism behind the reduction in heart function during these emotional uh, uh, or physical stressors is because of catecholamines, an excess of catecholamines, which is released by the autonomic nervous system, system in particular, the sympathetic nervous system. Another postulated mechanism is microvascular dis dysfunction and coronary artery spasm. Symptoms include substernal chest pressure, similar to acute heart attacks. The EKG is also typically abnormal. Cardiac enzymes such as troponins are often elevated in the bloodstream. And an echocardiogram shows the reduced heart function. So in many cases, patients will actually be sent to the left heart catheterization lab to further evaluate for coronary artery disease, which typically shows minimal coronary artery disease or less than 50%, and then the diagnosis of Takasubo is made. Next slide, please. On this slide, um, if you hover down at the left lower hand corner, um, you should be able to uh, click play uh, and see the motion of the heart in Takasubo cardiomyopathy. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a small triangle that's moving and that's the, actually the right ventricle. On the right-hand side, you'll see a larger area on the screen. That's actually the left ventricle. The base of the left ventricle is moving well. However, the top of the left ventricle, the apex, which is at the top of the screen, is not moving at all. And that is the apical ballooning that we see in Takasubo, Takasubo cardiomyopathy. Next slide, please. So for decades, coronary heart disease was diagnosed by identifying a significant stenosis or blockage in an epicardial coronary artery. And it was felt that patients with angina, but no obstructive epicardial coronary heart disease must have a non-cardiac etiology for their symptoms. So on the left-hand side, you see a picture of the left heart catheterization. That is what we typically see when we, when we take patients to the cath lab and look at the big arteries of the heart. However, functional changes at the site of epicardial vessels and or the microcirculatory system, which you can see all the way at the right-hand side, in some individuals lead to actually true myocardial ischemia resulting in symptoms while motion abnormalities on stress tests and stress echocardiogram, as well as perfusion defects on stress tests, but they have no coronary artery disease on the left heart catheterization. So it perplexed many cardiologists for many years. And then we finally figured out that the coronary artery system is kind of like a tree. There's a big trunk, which is the aorta, and off of the aorta comes a bunch of different branches. Some of the branches are big, but a lot of the branches are very, very small. And we cannot see those very small branches on the left heart catheterization that you can see in the left-hand side of the screen. However, in the middle of the screen is a picture of what the coronary uh, anatomy looks like, including the microvascular system. Now, microvascular coronary disease is more commonly seen in women. And so sometimes women are dismissed 
they may have a small abnormality on their stress test, but no epicardial coronary artery disease. And it's just sort of chalked up to, you know, maybe an artifact or something. But patients typically have true chest pain and have true microvascular disease um, and typically respond to nitroglycerin. There are ways to test this. In particular, we can do measurements of coronary blood flow in the cath lab to specifically test for microvascular disease. And we can also do two different types of stress tests, which are non-invasive to test for microvascular disease, which is PET stress or CMR stress. Next slide, please. So symptoms of an actual heart attack of the big epicardial coronary arteries in women don't always present typically with crushing substernal chest pain or an elephant on your chest. I've seen many, many patients present with fatigue. And it's usually, again, patients come in, women come in and they say, I've been able to walk two miles and I realize I'm getting older and now I'm only able to walk one mile, but recently I can only walk a quarter of a mile before I have to stop and rest. And that's very concerning for coronary artery disease. I also had a woman that was diabetic and she was having some numbness and tingling in just one of her hands and her fingertips when she would walk, which would stop after she stopped exercising. She went to see her primary care physician who thought that the numbness and tingling was neuropathy from diabetes. However, when she came to see me, I was very concerned that it was exertional related and went ahead and did a stress test and she ended up having uh, actually significant amount of coronary artery disease and had multiple stents placed. Um, patients uh, can present with nausea. Um, patients can present with pain in the back or the neck or just pain down the arm. Um, so again, anything that is in particular exertional related, but even once it becomes related to rest, uh, at rest is very concerning for heart disease and you should always uh, take that to your primary care physician or a cardiologist for further evaluation, obviously the emergency department if it's severe. So angina is actually chest pain attributable to ischemia or low blood flow to the heart muscle. The quality is typically squeezing, tightness, pressure, and constriction. Angina is typically gradual in onset and offset with the intensity of the discomfort increasing and decreasing over several minutes. In contrast, non-cardiac pain is often greatest intensity at its onset and often has an abrupt onset and offset. Patients tend to have the same quality of chest discomfort with recurrent ischemic episodes and is generally felt in the same location. Next slide, please. So you have chest pain. So what test will my doctor order? I'm gonna sort of start with an idea that I like to explain to my patients in the office of the the heart as a house. You sort of got the lower level, which are the two ventricles, the right and the left ventricles. Those are the main pumping chambers of the heart. And then you have the second floor, which are the top chambers of the heart, the atria. In the middle, you have the valves, aortic valve, mitral valve, tricuspid valve. And what you see here on this picture is generally what we see when we look at an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart. A test like this would be ordered for chest pain, for palpitations, for shortness of breath, and swelling in the legs. Next slide, please. So inside of the house, you have to have electricity. So when patients come to the office and they have problems with tachycardia, fast heart rate, fluttering of the heart, palpitations, that's a problem potentially of the electricity of the heart. And so typically what's ordered is an EKG, possibly an exercise treadmill test, but definitely a Holter monitor or an event monitor where we can look at the rhythm of the heart for a period of time. And I put a couple of examples of that at the bottom of the screen, as well as an electrical picture uh, of the heart on the right-hand side. Next slide, please. Then we move on to the plumbing of the house, which I consider the coronary arteries. As you can see, it's a pretty busy slide because there are lots of different tests for the coronary arteries. Some are functional tests and some are structural tests. So we'll go through those at this point in time quickly. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
So which stress test should you have? The choice of stress testing modality depends on many factors, including but not limited to the ability to actually perform adequate exercise and reach 85% of your maximum heart rate for your age for it to be an adequate stress test. A resting EKG, if you have abnormalities on your resting EKG, that may persuade us to do a chemical or some other type of test. Clinical indication for performing the test, the patient's body habitus, and history of prior coronary revascularization. Next slide, please. So for plain old exercise treadmill stress tests, there are concerns about the predictive accuracy in women, because in general, women do have a lower prevalence of coronary artery disease than men of the same age until again, we become postmenopausal where we catch up with men. Women have a higher prevalence of non-obstructive coronary artery disease and microvascular disease while not associated with obstructive disease on angiography, again, can cause uh, um, uh, future cardiac events and cause symptoms. There is a modestly higher incidence of false positive ST segment depression and the optimal diagnostic strategy from a, cardio from a, a cardiovascular uh, standpoint and cost effectiveness is not yet known. So this is a picture of a nuclear stress test where we include imaging. On the top, you see what looks like a picture of some segments of the heart, which are normal, and that's at rest. On the bottom, you see pictures of the heart that are abnormal, and that's after stress. As you can see, we are not directly looking at the coronary arteries. We're looking at the radio tracer and the perfusion of blood flow with the radio tracer in it to the myocardium. Next slide, please. With the stress echocardiogram, we are looking at the same thing. Again, please notice that we are not looking directly at the coronary arteries, but the heart muscle itself. We can correlate distinctions in differences in heart function in the different regions and correlate with the, with the appropriate coronary artery that serves the area. Next slide, please. A PET stress test is similar to the first one, the nuclear stress test. Next slide, please. This is a cardiac MRI stress test. We can see again the same uh, and testing the uh, myocardial perfusion. We can also determine whether or not patients have amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, or any infiltrative heart disease. So all of these stress tests that I've just showed you, not one of them showed you the coronary arteries. Next slide, please. So this is what typically happens. People have stress tests and then a month later they have a heart attack and they wonder why they had a normal stress test and how can they have a heart attack a month later with a normal stress test. This is the reason, because we're not looking at the coronary arteries. We're looking at perfusion. You can have coronary artery disease and not have any problems perfusing the heart muscle. Your arteries need to be blocked around 70% for us to see a perfusion defect. If there is 50% blockage of the coronary arteries, you can absolutely have a normal stress test. However, with plaque inside the coronary artery, there is a fibrous cap that covers it. If it becomes unstable because of high blood pressure, high sugar, um, smoking, that all irritates the fibrous cap. It can rupture and cause an acute thrombus that forms inside the coronary artery. Basically, it's trying to plug up uh, what's happening with the fibrous cap rupturing and exposing the contents of the plaque to the artery. And it stops blood flow to the heart muscle. And you have a heart attack. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of different ways to look inside of the coronary arteries. One is with a CT angiogram. That is a CT scan, so it is non-invasive, and it does look inside of the coronary arteries. That way you can get a better understanding of if you have coronary artery disease and are at risk for plaque rupture. Next slide, please. The next way is an invasive procedure left heart catheterization where you go to the cath lab and you have a catheter placed inside of your coronary artery where contrast is injected so you can fully see any blockages. This is the gold standard of diagnosing coronary artery disease. Next slide, please. The next 
slide is about prevention. So we started with prevention, we're ending with prevention. And it's about a coronary calcium score, which can diagnose coronary artery disease and give you an understanding of what your risk, 10 year risk of cardiovascular disease events are. Next slide, please. And just for the sake of time, we can actually go to the next one. So this slide is also about prevention. So two prevention tools, the coronary artery calcium score, as well as the ASCVD risk score. Uh, this is a score that we proceed with in risk discussions with patients between the ages of 20 and 75 years of age, and we reassess every four to six years in patients who identified risk is low or borderline. We reassess more, free, more frequently for patients who are identified as a 10-year risk of intermediate. Next slide, please. So again, we started the talk with controlling cardiac risk factors, identifying and controlling them. And we are ending the talk with the same, how to prevent heart disease and how to discuss what kind of disease prevention tools are available for you, coronary artery calcium score, as well as ASCVD risk score. As women, we often put others' needs before ours. We take care of everyone and everything. That takes time, that takes effort. However, your life, your health, your well being is worthy of that same time and effort. Make the move, literally and figuratively, to take care of your body, your mind, in order to protect your heart and your life. Thank you so much. Dr. Patterson, thanks for you. Thanks for that tremendous uh, presentation. A lot of information. Um, we have questions that was given to us when individuals registered, as well as people have put uh, questions in the Q and A. So continue to put questions in the Q and A. We may not have enough time for all the questions, but what we'll do is we'll answer those questions and we'll post them on the website at the conclusion of this presentation. So the first question I have is for Ms. Rosa. Um, you kind of shared a little bit about um, when you was first having symptoms and you saw your provider and it was kind of it was kind of dismissive. Um, and based on um, what you've heard from Dr. Patterson, what type of information that she provided uh, that if you would have known that years ago, how would that have maybe changed the course of your journey? Thank you, Dr. Moore, that's a good question. At the time I was going through my story, I must say I would probably have asked for a stress test earlier as I was unfamiliar with the process once you had symptoms. My family history consisted of diabetes and breast cancer, which is a statistic of one in eight. I was unfamiliar that with heart disease, the statistics were one in three. So as soon as I had started having those types of symptoms, I would have probably had uh, a more serious conversation with my primary care and actually um, asked for a stress test earlier. But not being aware of the process, I was just going through the various um, guessing game of what could be wrong with me. Thank you. And Dr. Patterson, we have a question, an individual, we talked about the loss of hormones as uh, women go to the postmenopausal phase of their life. And uh, we have an individual that asked a question of a breast cancer survivor, and she's on medications to reduce the estrogen. How does that uh, increase her chances of heart disease? So at this point, the studies show, um, I'm assuming it's tamoxifen, um, have not uh, significantly impacted the risk of heart disease. Um, however, if uh, the patient has left-sided breast cancer and receives radiation uh, for the left-sided breast cancer, the heart uh, is typically within that plane of radiation and can increase coronary artery disease progression uh, in a more rapid manner. And uh, if the patient also receives adriamycin or doxorubicin uh, for breast cancer, that can actually lead to heart failure. And so uh, echocardiograms are typically performed on a regular basis 
um, in survivorship, uh, it's typically recommended to get an ultrasound and follow up an echocardiogram and follow up at least five years after the last adriamycin or doxorubicin dose. Um, and after that, uh, it is quite unclear how often to repeat the echocardiogram after the five years post survival. However, there is a theory of a double hit of a process where the adriamycin um, has potentially um, changed uh, the, under, the underlying cellular um, um, environment in the myocardium and with uh, increasing amount of risk factors will put that patient who has received the adriamycin at higher risk for heart failure. Thank you. And, and seeming that we're in um, this COVID pandemic, what are some COVID considerations for individuals that are at risk or have uh, heart disease? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question. And I have to say that in my clinical practice, I am seeing a lot of patients post COVID infection with tachycardia, resting tachycardia, um, where they did not have that previously. Um, and some of the patients that I'm seeing um, are you know, avid exercisers and have typically lower heart rates uh, because of their exercise, um, but now have a resting tachycardia. Um, and many of these patients are actually women. Um, I'm seeing a lot of women post COVID with palpitations um, and I'm seeing a lot of chest pain. And typically for my COVID patients, I will go through, of course, if they're having tachycardia palpitations, get an event monitor or a Holter monitor, do an ultrasound, make sure that they have a structurally ab uh, normal heart. Because again, I'm looking at that left atrium to see if there's any structural abnormalities of, le of the left atrium um, in regards to atrial fibrillation, putting them at risk for atrial fibrillation. Um, also with the chest pain, um, there is some concern for myopericarditis. Remember the inner lining of the heart and also that outer, outer lining of the heart as well. So anytime a patient comes to me and they also have chest pain post COVID, I'm typically ordering a cardiac MRI uh, to look for inflammation of the pericardium and the myocardium and including a stress component for that um, to rule out coronary artery disease as well. Thank you. And uh, individuals may have been recently diagnosed with hypertension and they're starting on blood pressure medications. Um, so can a person uh, lose weight uh, and exercise that will cause them to decrease their dependence on blood pressure medications? Absolutely, absolutely. I've, I've had patients that have been diabetic and have had high blood pressure and started exercising and eating a, a, a good diet, a Mediterranean diet and lost weight and came off of their diabetic medication and their antihypertensives. So yes, it, it is absolutely possible. Um, you know, of course, genetics play a role as we discussed um, and also age. Uh, as we get older, our arteries tend to stiffen over time. So most people of a certain age will be on high blood pressure medication just because of the stiffening of the arteries. Um, but of course, if you don't exercise and don't eat the right diet, then instead of being on you know, maybe one antihypertensive, you may be on three. So you know, doing the best that you can do for your body by um, uh, exercising and dieting will definitely help reduce the amount of blood pressure pills that you're on, if not stop them entirely depending on your age and genetics. Thank you. And I know recently there's been some new studies that have come out, you know, people have been told to take a baby aspirin to help <laughs> decrease their uh, chances of having a heart attack. Uh, can you address some of the new changes that came out so How people can better understand? We, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that much time. If you get a quick answer. <laughs> talk about that for at least a half an hour. Um, so, you know, there, there used to be aspirin for primary prevention. Um, obviously, aspirin is always indicated in secondary prevention, which is secondary prevention is someone that's had a heart attack um, or, you know, has had a cardiovascular event 
primary prevention is for somebody that has a lot of risk factors, but hasn't had a stroke or heart attack or cardiovascular event. Um, <clears throat> and we used to think that at one time that it was actually helping to save lives. And we've learned that unfortunately with many lives saved, there has also been um, many side effects in particular bleeding. Uh, that has caused uh, some hospitalizations and even death. Um, so the risk benefit ratio is really one that needs to be thought out uh, and examined very carefully between the patient and the primary pro provider or cardiologist. Um, it's really on a patient by patient basis. Um, and so, you know, and unfortunately, I really can't make a generalized comment because it really is so patient specific. Thank you. And for Ms. Rosa, I have a question for you. I would like to, to hear your, um, your thoughts. Um, it sounds like, you know, it's really important for women, especially women of color, to advocate for themselves. Um, what is your thoughts? as relates to um, how structural racism within the healthcare system may play a role in this? Well, as person of color, there's always that in the back of your mind that there's something else going on. And if someone is being dismissive to the point where they're saying something ridiculous, then it's time to find another doctor someone is going to listen to you. The person that's telling you that it's acid reflux or gastric issue to, oh, maybe you have a heavy purse or maybe you just have a little stress. Those type of dismissive things in our society only lead to more detriment. Speak up as much as you can there is a physician out there that's gonna to listen to you and give you the proper diagnosis and the proper screenings. Don't just stop and second guess that, oh, maybe it's nothing. Um, maybe it's just a bad day. If you're not feeling well, then something is wrong. It's unfortunate that people of color are dismissed maybe because of lack of insurance or lack of providers, but there is someone out there that will listen. Thank you. And uh, for Dr. Patterson, uh, you know, sometimes we have a lot of clinical trials, research studies that having a history of cardiac disease is an exclusionary criteria where we have a lot of people that really can benefit from the research, not be able to participate. What are your thoughts concerning, you know, participation in clinical trials as cardiovascular disease is exclusionary criteria? Yeah, I think that's really important, um, especially in the field of cardio-oncology, uh, which I see many, many cardio-oncology patients um, because it's not real life. Um, most patients, again, uh, of a certain age have some coronary artery disease, uh, and it's just unrealistic uh, to exclude patients from clinical trials that have coronary artery disease, um, because again, you're going to be giving this therapy to patients in real life scenarios that are most likely going to have um, some, some amount of, of coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease in general. Uh, and that includes, you know, hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Many of the prostate cancer therapies actually um, uh, really are very detrimental to the metabolic uh, values that we look at, such as the name we see for diabetes and lipids and can actually um, works in cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and instigate plaque rupture. So, you know, trials of many of the medications should have real life patients uh, included in them with cardiovascular disease to give us uh, um, an idea of 
potential cardiovascular events um, that patients could suffer uh, from being on that particular therapy. Thank you. And um, what are your thoughts about the impact of high energy drinks have on cardiovascular disease? Yeah, so um, usually the high, high energy drinks uh, have a lot of caffeine and um, other things in it that typically engage the sympathetic nervous system, um, which increases norepinephrine and epinephrine. Uh, that increases blood pressure and increases heart rate. Um, many people come to me have, that have palpitations and are drinking large amounts of, of caffeinated beverages or you know, the energy drinks um, before exercising. And it, all it's doing is, is increasing the heart rate, increasing the catecholamines, increasing that surge, which of course is gonna make the heart race and blood pressure increase and uh, potentially result in a cardiac event. So I discourage it. Um, if you need energy, uh, usually that comes by you know, starting the exercise. People in general, I think, you know, feel fatigued during the day. But instead of having an energy drink, if you could take a five or 10 minute walk, or even if you're at work and you do the stairs up and down the stairs a couple of times, you might actually feel more energized. Most people do. It's when they're sitting for the day and doing their multiple Zoom meetings one after another, and you feel tired by the end of the day. If you can get up instead of having that energy drink to make you feel more energized, get up intermittently throughout the day, make even if it's five minutes um, of, of time for yourself in between Zoom meetings um, to walk the stairs, to walk around your couch, to do some sit-ups, to do some push-ups, I, I can almost guarantee that you're not going to feel as fatigued and tired by the end of the day because you've gotten your body uh, to move around. Thank you. So I have one last question before we have to conclude our Q&A session. Um, C-reactive protein. Um, mm -hmm. How does C-reactive protein uh, is evaluated when it becomes, or is it good for it to be become part of the diagnostic workup for an individual? Yeah, C-reactive protein is, uh, it does give us some insight of the inflammation uh, that, that can be occurring in particular in the coronary arteries, but um, other inflammatory conditions can increase it as well. Um, so it's not only specific just to the coronary arteries, uh, but yeah, it, in general, it, it does give us insight uh, into what's going on. And um, that is a useful tool um, to, to gauge over time. Um, and however, so is coronary artery calcium score. Um, that, that has also been proven uh, to be uh, very, very useful in predicting cardiovascular events. Um, so in, this, in the setting of prevention, um, CRP is useful. Um, however, it's not quite as predictive of cardiovascular events as a coronary artery calcium score and the ASCVD. Um, but uh, yes, it is still useful. Thank you. So I want to thank you, Dr. Patterson and uh, Ms. Rosa for an excellent presentation and answering the questions in the Q&A. And we'll get uh, the rest of the questions and we'll get answers out to the audience. So right now, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Packingham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can start my video. There we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Patterson and Ms. Rosa for those very informative presentations. Um, I think we learned at each one of these webinars that we know our own bodies. We know our bodies the best. So we should listen to what our bodies are telling us and, and be proactive and advocate for ourselves. Again, thank you so much, Ms. Rosa and Dr. Patterson. I would like to remind everyone that we have heart health resources that are available and located on the Women's Health Awareness website. 
Also, please note uh, that this session was be, has been recorded. So if you found this information uh, helpful to you and maybe helpful to your family members, please go to our website and watch the webinar again. There was so much information packed into this uh, 45 minute session. Um, immediately after the webinar, evalu evaluations will be sent um, through email for attending the webinar and for completing the evaluation. You will receive educational contact credit hours for your participation. For those of you who completed the evaluation and signed up to be part of the raffle, the winner will be announced at our 8th Annual Women's Health Awareness Conference on April the 9th. So our January raffle winner was Ms. Victoria Green Epps of Franklinton, North Carolina. Congratulations, Ms. Green Epps. Uh, we will send you your, um, your gift certificate um, via the mail. I want to remind everyone about the 8th Annual Women's Health Awareness Women's Wellness Conference that will take place on April 8th from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Registration is free and is now open on the Women's Health Awareness website. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the continued high transmission rates for North Carolina, we have decided that the Women's Health Awareness Conference will be virtual. It was a tough decision because we had so many folk who were willing to come in person. However, safety of our participants has to be our number one priority at this time. The WAR Steering Committee has worked diligently to bring you a virtual conference that will have a wide variety of concurrent health and healthy living sessions for you to choose from like our past in-person conferences. Additionally, we will have helpful resources. For women needing free mammograms, you can still sign up on the registration site. We will offer these at a later date and you will be contacted with that information. Thank you for joining us this evening. We hope tonight's session was informative and the information you received will help enhance your daily lives. As always, thank you for your continued support and attendance. Have a great evening, be well, stay safe, and we will see you on the 8th at our 8th Annual Women's Health Awareness Conference on April the 9th, 2022. Have a great evening. Good night.